Hi, Karina. Hi. Daily, welcome. Thanks for coming, joining us here at Town Meeting TV. Um, you for work, having me. Yeah, so you work at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. I do. I'm a restora re restoration ecologist there, and I work on water policy, and I manage the dam removal program for VNRC. Yeah, so I was on your website, and I was watching some videos. You have a lot of really interesting videos of a dam removal. Yeah. And, um, and then I had some questions, so thanks for coming in. Um, let's take a big look at Vermont landscape and how the water flows, because yes. I think that's the part that kind of is interesting. And I have here, um, i got to put my glasses on, but I have here a map of Vermont, and I'm wondering if you can share with us the... Um, so this is the physical map of Vermont, sort of a big picture map. And I wonder if you'd just talk a little bit about the watersheds and how water flows through our state. Totally. So there are four major watersheds in Vermont. Um, and you can sort of divide it in half. And a large portion goes to Lake Champlain, and then a large portion goes to Connecticut. But then in the upper north, um, there's a small portion that goes to Lake Memphremagalog, so flows north, and then there's a small portion in the south that flows to the Hudson. Yes. Yes, yep. yes down yep. there. Yep. So, um, so that's how it goes, but you have to think about the state and where you are in the state and then figure out which direction the water is flowing. Yep. Um, but primarily my work focuses on the eastern portion, or excuse me, the western portion of the state that flows to Lake Champlain and then um, f as far as the dam removal work goes, and then Connecticut River Conservancy works on dam removals in the eastern portion of the state towards the Connecticut. I'm gonna move over to the dam removal map because that gives us another picture, sort of a bigger view of Vermont. And this has um, all the dots represent either dams that are operational, dams that have been removed, dams yeah sort of all the dams in vermont it's the vermont dam inventory layer so it's a layer that's managed by vermont dam safety that we have imported into our free vermont rivers website um, just to track dams and then we've sort of categorized it by those that are um, you know active functioning dams and those that are um, derelict abandoned dams um, those that we have removed, like physically removed, versus those that have been breached by natural causes. Um, so yeah, that's and what I, that map shows. And I think on your website, it, what, we have about 800? Yes, there are about 800 to 1,000 um, derelict dams in the state that are just remnant dams from um, the industrial era when they were used for power um, for mills and those dams are, are no longer do, serving any useful purpose. So they're in the waterway, they're a, a barrier, whether it's a stone or an earthen or a concrete barrier to um, a river system. So it's basically fragmenting a, a river system and creating this impoundment um, that then becomes a lake behind the dam. Yeah, there's a picture here. Um what, what, what dam is, what's, where is this located? So, uh, this is the Pelletier Dam in Castleton, Vermont, off of East, in, off East Hubberton Road, and it's on a tributary to the Castleton River. It's called North Breton Brook, and we are actually removing that dam um, as we speak. So removal started in um, July 7th and is about a two-month process. Um, so yeah, there's excavators on site right now, and we've chipped away at the face of the dam, and they've built a temporary access road behind the dam to remove the impounded sediment that's accumulated behind that jam, dam to restore the historic channel. So. so that's a lot of word, impounded sediment. Impound so one of the things, you know, one of the videos I watched was the Millbrook Dam. Mill Pond Dam. Mill Pond, yeah, Mill Pond Colchester. Dam in Colchester. And um, I think it's I think it said twenty thousand pounds of impounded Fos sediment, sediment filled with phosphorus. Yes. Talk a little bit about what happens when when buildup. So the water is carrying 
Right. So, so rivers transport sediment um, along with wildlife and nutrients. So there's all these things moving through a river system naturally that, and you know, starts in the headwaters and ultimately ends up in Lake Champlain or the ocean, depending on where you are. Um, but when you when you block that system and create a dam, that sediment builds up behind that dam, so it's impounded. And historically, with the, you know, with these mills, they would have to clean out the, dredge the pond regularly to keep it so that you could actively provide um, energy there. But with these abandoned dams, no one's dredging and that sediment's accumulating and over time it just creates this huge um, pile of impounded sediment. And whatever is in that sediment is certainly dependent on what's upstream of the dam. So, you know, in urban areas or areas with lots of intensive ag above them, those tend to be higher in phosphorus. So a dam lower in the watershed might have more phosphorus than a dam high up in the watershed that's really in a forested area that doesn't have a lot of um, activity upstream, human activity. So, so that um, so yeah, when you're removing, so it depends on the dam, certainly the amount of phosphorus behind the dam, and often there can be other contaminants as well. We removed a dam in Rutland last year that had, the mill was a tannery, so there was like some, um, definitely some, some contaminant, contaminants in that dam, so that sediment has to be um, stored within the city of Rutland, so because it's it's hazardous, um, but it's fine to use within the, the the soils layer within the city of Rutland. So, so yeah, depending on the dam, um, there's a, a huge phosphorus benefit with all the dams, um, both from the sediment you're actually removing that one-time sediment, but also just from a functioning floodplain. Um, concept of connecting the river system and restoring the floodplain and creating a moving channel and just reconnecting that um, geomorphology, you're improving sediment. So there's like a sediment or a phosphorus crediting system now through the Functioning Floodplain Initiative, huh. which is um, a program that a DEC has started. Um, and so there's there's a, actually a phosphorus calculator now for dam removal work and culvert replacements and reconnecting rivers. And is that for landowners to use? To um, it's for basically it's for for water quality projects. So projects that have clean water funding through the state, based on okay. the EPA's TMDL for Lake Champlain. TMDL. Total maximum daily load of phosphorus. Got it. That can, um, so the EPA has to set a threshold for Lake Champlain and um, so, so in trying to meet that TMDL goals, um, there is, there's a huge effort to yeah. restore river systems and reconnect waters and create floodplains and restore wetlands and basically create functioning freshwater systems um, that connect to the lake or connect, connect to the Connecticut River. Um, and so there is a phosphorus calculator that helps just figure out benefits when you're weighing all these projects and which ones to do. They're, they're all very important in different ways and a piece of that puzzle is the phosphorus crediting system. Great. Um, so I brought up the map again because I think the you know for me the big picture is about how water flows through. So water is you know it evaporates, it comes down, and the land, the surface water, and then the groundwater, it's all right. part of the same network. I, yes. I think of it as almost yeah. like a big lacy system. Totally underground, above ground, it's the lifeblood, right? Right. <laughs> Um, and what do and so why is it important to like have water flowing through those ecosystems? Um, it's important for biodiversity. I mean, it moves food um, and habitat, wildlife through systems, and those systems are dynamic and they need that energy. So ultimately, the lake depends on cold water and temperature and turbidity and uh, dissolved oxygen, all of those things, and that sediment creates point bars and beach formations and all of that stuff. So um, 
So having those systems moving and functioning is critical to ultimately to the health of the lake, but also to the health of those river systems and all of the species that live there. Um, so one question, and this may not even be relevant, should these dams never have been built for the health and safety, or is this just, this is where we're at in terms yeah. of improving the health and safety of the lake today? Well, I think they, they truly served a purpose in the industrial age, and that's why a lot of our town centers are along river systems, is because that's where the power was, and that's where the settlement is. That power, um, you know, is not, no longer an efficient source, and those small dams are, are no longer beneficial, and the value in reconnecting them and the benefits of that far outweighs um, what was the historical benefit of having those dams. So that's real. Um, that being said, there you know the residences, the urban development is still along the waterways in certain areas. So we have to protect that infrastructure and um, to the best of our ability. Yeah. Um, and but yes, with climate change and climate preparedness, um, reconnecting rivers through dam removal and culvert replacement is a nature-based sol solution um, that helps provide a resilient landscape and hopefully helps like lower temperature and um, improve the quality of, of the river system Neat. and the lake. And maybe keeps the beaches open. And hopefully keeps the beaches open. I mean, right. it's all That's contributing. Why. Yeah, there's That's... a lot of factors there, but yep. um, this is certainly one of them. Well, because the phosphorus feeds the cyanobacteria yes. or is... Yes, and the, yeah, the just the lack phosphorus of phosphorus just for folks, like, pho like back phosphorus is like, nutrients it's yes yes it's nutrients and um it's a it's a on. concentration of nutrients i am not you know a phosphorus expert by any means so that uh, the matt vaughn from lake champlain basin i think he was on a couple or he was on vpr a couple of weeks ago but yeah. he's the guy to talk to about the phosphorus blooms and the cyanobacteria but certainly um the more we can do to keep keep the system connected and water moving. It's that lack of oxygen that creates the cyanobacteria blooms. Got it. Yeah. And, 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 but phosphorus is like a buildup of uh, waste matter? Yes. Like yes, animal, exactly. yes. human, yes. cows. Yes, so it, and it can come from agricultural runoff um, and from stormwater systems and wastewater systems. Are you finding, is there resistance in communities to removal of these stamps? Um, yeah, certainly there is. Um, a lot of these dams are historic and people love the, the history that's associated with the dam. The dam tells a story to them. Their aesthetically can be very pleasing. Some people say they like the sound of the water flowing over oh. the dam. So there's, there are all those factors. Um, so, so people are attached to their dams in some ways, but I feel that in working with these communities, and it takes a long time to remove a dam, it can be like a three to five year process in a lot of places, and over that time, um, we certainly wouldn't push a dam that the community didn't support, but um, just spending time with them to identify the values of that community Often what comes forward is the values of recreation, having a connected system, improving biodiversity, improving water temperature, water quality, um, and, and public safety. You know, if these dams fail, it, there can be a huge flood threat as well, which is something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of until it's too late. Um, so those benefits far outweigh the benefit of having the historic dam and the sound. And some people just, it's a change of thinking to have a historic dam that makes noise versus a naturally free, free flowing river that makes, you know, that um, babbles, a babbling brook in their yeah. backyard versus an impounded stagnant pond. Um, so those are, those are changes that take time and not everyone is open to that, but, um, yeah, we'll play, at the end of this, we'll play the Mill Pond Dam. Removal. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just going to bring it up here for a second. Um, and um, you can see that water flowing through. And, and you can see the failing dam, how much water is seeping through the, con you know, the stone or the concrete. Um, but that is just a, a dam that potentially could fail with the next storm. So. 
so that's a that's a real thing is that there isn't funding to restore these old dams because they're they're the not used. House yeah. and the dam. And is were this built Indian Brook Wood ends up in Indian no, Brook Reservoir in or vice versa? This is below Indian Brook built, Reservoir. So it comes out of yes. the pictures that I saw yes. at the um, town um, offices. Um, there were yeah. several buildings on um, both sides of the road. And, and have I there been any no examples of stories where people have um, preserved this particular historic site elements? Will serve a very yes, important, yes. Uh, so yes, so creating benches out of the historic stone and signage and leaving the abutments is a nice way to preserve um, the historic piece and still tell the story. Neat. Um, let's go back and look at the website for a, a few minutes um, and just walk us through this because this is pretty yeah. amazing, the work that VNRC has done. Um, and this is freevermontrivers.org. That's a project of VNRC? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and tell us a little bit about VNRC. Who are you? Where do you, where do you get your funding from? How do you? Yeah. yeah. So Vermont Natural Resources Council is a nonprofit environmental advocacy group. Um, and we work on environmental policy and community policy issues throughout the state. And um, as part of that work, we also do some actual on the ground implementation of ecological restoration based um, projects and dam removal is one of those that uh, VNRC took on before my time. Brian Fitzgerald worked um, before me in this position and I took over his position about two and a half years ago and um, I hadn't actually removed a dam until two years ago but I had a strong water um, resource scientist um, background as a consulting scientist both in wetlands and wildlife and was excited to um, jump into this role and there was a huge need throughout the state just with the number of dams that are derelict and in disrepair and causing a public hazard. So, um, and part of that position I chair the Vermont Dam Task Force which is a coalition of scientists, um, just private folks, um, regulators, state and federal, anyone really who's interested in dam removal and the projects around the state um, are, is welcome to join. We meet every other month and we sort of just come together to discuss the projects, prioritize projects, um, support each other with funding. It takes a lot of money to remove a dam and a lot of planning and community support. So it's truly a team effort and um, the dam task force is leading that effort and um, so folks can come to you and say I want to I have a dam on my property or I, I've identified a dam or and I want I'd like to see this removed yes and they so I should also say that Vermont dam safety has a button on where their website where you can actually put in the information of your dam if it doesn't show up on the map because certainly what we have as far as our inventory isn't completely up to date. So there's more dams out there than we have. So you can always add your dam there. But reaching out to me at VNRC and um, the, either through VNRC or the Free Vermont Rivers website is another way to um, identify your dam. And then if you're so interested in removal or wanting to learn more um, and a lot of people are interested because it's a liability to have a dam on their property from an insurance um, from insurance perspective because if again if that dam were to fail and there was people swimming below it or um, hanging out in the river the, that or potentially damaging public infrastructure roads houses downstream so there's a lot of different scenarios and reasons why you don't necessarily want to own a dam, especially a dam that you can't repair. So um, folks reach out and we have a list and we prioritize it for removal and funding. And the funding is coming from all different folks and the more um, stakeholders we have in the process, the stronger the process is. So we have US Fish and Wildlife as a funder, um, DEC through the Clean Water Program and the EPA funds. Um, the Nature Conservancy is a funder, VNRC obviously through our work, um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department is a funder, they also own, so the state owns a lot of dams as well, so we're working on the dam we're removing in 
Castleton is a state-owned dam. So um, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of other funders. Lake Champlain Basin Program yeah. is a huge funder. Yeah, it sounds well. like a partnership. Yes, and, strong uh, partnership. And, and let's go back and look at the Free Vermont Rivers um, website just briefly and walk us through how someone might use this um, to understand what's going on. Yeah, so you can go to this website and sort of, um, it's sort of designed to be a road map for learning about dam removal. And the Vermont Dam Mapper shows all of those active dams in the state. You can toggle back and forth and um, zoom into an area. And um, so let's turn, if we want to go under project status there, Megan, and you can turn on um, removed. Yeah, and then you can zoom right into one of those dams and see. Let's do one in our area. Yeah, so maybe Mill Pond, we could find Mill Pond or. Would that be in closer to here? Well, let's do this one here yeah. in Essex Junction. That's my hometown. So here okay. we are, yeah. So Jericho won on the Lamoille River. And if you scroll down there, sometimes you can find out more information on when it was removed. So it's a headwater of the Browns River that gives you the coordinates. Um, this one in particular doesn't have a ton of information as to when it was removed, but it does have an ecological rating so that tier TNT it was a medium rated dam as far as ecological value for removal. And so let's see, we'll go to Chase, Chase Mills. Mills. Huh. So that's, yeah. So, so there's all. These may have been removed, but yes, earlier. Yes, these were earlier. Yeah. Um, Tell me, where would I find let the. Let me um, help you find one that is yeah. like Mel Pond or anything like that, too. So this hasn't been updated from last year yet because we're still so it's, in the process. Yeah. It's so interesting, though, all of those. Um, done already. Just all of those little tiny dams that at some point, is there ever in any of these okay, cases so have you found a dam that people thought, well, we're not going to remove this, we're going to actually reuse it? Is there any like rest restoration and reusing of dams? Um, so there are some dams that have, you know, there's all, obviously we're working to meet our renewable energy goals as well and hydropower is a form of um, energy, renewable energy on some level, but a lot of these dams, it's not efficient, they're not efficient to provide hydropower, they're not designed for that, that's not what they were built, I mean they were built really as a small scale dam. Um, but there are proposals that come forward for small scale hydropower on some of these dams sometimes. Um, one of them is the Swanton Dam, um, Stone Cat Hydro, just submitted a proposal for um, relicensing of that dam for hydro and that has been a abandoned unused dam and we'll see how that process plays out um, if it can meet the Vermont water quality standards then which um, require fish passage and temperature control and all of the things that um, keep our waters clean then then that could be a successful project but um, but yeah so Oh, so that's neat. This is, um, I just want to sh share one more piece from the dam removal, the freevermontrivers.org website, yeah. which is this, um, what do we call this, like kind of a geospatial? Yeah, so this is um, drone footage. We've been trying to collect um, aerial imagery pre and post dam removal for yeah. um, a handful of projects throughout the state and we actually just received funding to continue this work so that's really exciting but um, so what are we looking at so here? right now you're looking at the Cross Brothers Dam in Northfield Vermont and that was the drone imagery flight that you see zoomed in over that select portion of the Dog River and you're looking at um, the the road there's a bridge crossing and then right sort of in the middle of the imagery and then right to the right of that you can see the dam and you, yep oh, right yeah, there yep. and so this is pre dam removal and we actually haven't removed this dam yet so we'll do another flyover post removal and see how this channel changes 
after removal and with the excavated sediment removal. And I could find out, I could go back to this dam removals in Vermont and find out how many dams are actually on the Dog River. Totally, where then, those barriers are. I mean, we only have a couple minutes left, but um, something like the impact of Irene yes. and these dams, what is there a relationship between if you know, something like the Dog River, which really carried a ton of water into yeah, all sorts yeah. of Waterbury, right? Um, the Intervale in Burlington. Totally. So, um, so removing these dams reconnects the river and reestablishes a floodplain. So, in an area that was impounded with sediment and holding back water, with a storm like Irene, there's nowhere for that water to go, but over the dam or breach the dam if the dam is not in good condition you know it just might blow out and flood downstream homes but with removal of the dam you then have a free flowing river with an established floodplain on either side so that That's those high picture. flows is that this picture hold on let me bring that picture up so we can see it um, yes yes yeah so this is a, a I gotta get back there, there you go okay. It's um, some drone imagery of another dam, Connolly Pond Dam, where we actually did have to do an emergency drawdown because the dam was failing and it was going to um, potentially damage downstream infrastructure. But you can see all the area that, all the bright green is the area that was impounded with water. And now you can see the natural channel flowing through and where, where it was a river and wants to be a river again. Yeah. Um, and you can see here where it, even this, this. Yes, that's where there's still a barrier. So it's yeah. starting to impound there. And we're hoping to take out. So this is an earthen dam that we will remove. And then you'll have a fully restored channel. But then when a storm event comes in a headwater dam like this or lower down, um, those high water, high flows can actually disperse within that natural floodplain. So we'll reform that floodplain. Um, Nate. Yeah. Karina, thank you so much for coming and sharing all this information. Is there any last thing that you feel like I really need to make sure people hear? I think it's just the importance of um, restoring these systems that, you know, we want fully functioning freshwater intact systems. It's really simple. It's just restoring what was historically there to the best that we can, given all of um, the human development that's on the landscape, and that's a reality as well. Yeah. So. And dams are one of the things that gets in the way of the systems exactly. among exactly so many something others. You can focus on yeah. and make an improvement. But it's really exciting work. Cool, great. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for sharing all this great information. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, and thanks for watching.